Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about some answers to one particular version of the problem of evil, uh, which is presented by a philosopher named William Rowe. Uh, now, what Rowe presents a version of the evidential problem of evil, uh, which is a form of inductive argument. However, Rowe's version of the argument, uh, rather than simply presenting evidence for the non-existence of God, attempts to show a contradiction, um, as the logical problem of evil attempts to do. And so, therefore, this serves as a kind of counter-argument to various deductive arguments for God's existence. Now, for more, on, more details on this argument, I have another video on the various versions of the problem of evil, including Rowe's version of the evidential problem. You'll find that linked in the description and up in the card and wherever else we'll find it um, associated with this video. Um, but for this one, I'm going to be assuming that we're already vaguely familiar, um, or at least fairly familiar, with Rowe's version of the argument, and so I'm going to get primarily into arguments against it. How do we answer this criticism? How do we answer this, uh, this key objection uh, to God's existence? Because versions of this are, uh, in my experience in, in the general field of philosophy of religion today, um, this is probably the most prominent argument for atheism, uh, at least in the, uh, in the uh, sort of professional zeitgeist right now. So in brief, Rowe's version of the problem presents the objection not that there is so much evil that there is more than we would expect from a loving God. That's something like the, the more traditional evidential problem of evil. Rather, Rowe's objection arises from the impossibility of presenting a theodicy, in other words, a hypothetical explanation for why God might permit the various instances of suffering that we observe in the world. So Rowe points out that not only are there instances of suffering, and that we can usually, as far as we know, we can provide some manner of theodicy. We can say that God might have permitted any given instance of evil for some greater good to come out of it, or at least that God could have or could bring some good out of any instance of suffering that he permits. So, for example, if I take my coffee and I take a sip, ah, and it's too hot, I burnt my tongue. That may be, let's say, an opportunity for me to learn the virtue of patience. And so, if that is the case, that is some good that God can bring out of the instance of suffering that I experience by burning my tongue. Um, now, no taste buds were harmed in the making of this video, not to worry, I did wait for my coffee to cool, I have learned that virtue of patience already, at least to some degree. Um, but just to use this as an illustration, Rowe's point here, though, is to, uh, to point to the sheer amount of suffering, the number of instances of suffering for which we would have to present theodicies. If I can present a theodicy for burning my tongue on coffee, um, that takes a finite amount of time. However, there are a, an indefinite number and a constantly increasing number of instances of suffering, both human and convenient example, as well as animal suffering. I have Angel here who is, I promise, not suffering at the moment, but sometimes she does. If she gets her claw stuck in something, or if one of the children get to her and happen to pull her tail or something like that. Those are instances of animal suffering as well. All of these sorts of things, whether human or animal suffering, are happening at an alarming rate, far faster than we can provide the Odysseys for. And so the problem that Roe presents is not simply that there is suffering, or even that there is a lot of suffering. The problem that Roe presents is that there are too many problems to answer. It's not that there's more problems than we would expect. It's not that the problems are more severe than we should think or should hope, given a loving God or anything like that. It's rather he accepts the traditional, um, the traditional approach of, of theodicy as like, something like what, uh, what Aquinas puts forward, that we would expect God to eliminate any instance of suffering unless he could bring some good out of it uh, through his love and providence. 
Ro accepts this, but he wants to point out that there are so many instances, and those instances are growing so quickly that we simply cannot hope to answer all of them. Now, how do we? Well, I can point out to begin with that we do this all of the time. Um, it's very common that we, uh, that we find a solution to a problem where the problem is not simply the problem that is before us, but the problem is that problems are compounding and growing at a rate that we cannot, uh, we cannot hope to handle one by one. Two key examples of this kind of problem solving uh, would be uh, algorithmic programming. So if we were to fix a bug, say, in a bit of software that is causing constant problems, say, in our computer, how you fix that problem is not by, by dealing with each, uh, each crash as it, as it arises or each problem as it arises. How we deal with that problem is we find the source of the problem, we find the broken code, or we patch it. Uh, we either fix the problem at its source or we come up with a solution that is going to automatically solve every problem when it arises. When this error occurs, do this and then the problem will be solved. This is why we have even things like error codes right, in, our, in our software. Maybe a more down-to-earth down to example, so to speak, um, would be something like, well, something very close to home for me, fire ants. We have fire ants in our yard, just like anyone in Florida, really. And how do you deal with fire ants? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, what you might do is you might just kill ants when you see them. You see an ant, you squish it. You see an ant, uh, you sick the cat on it, because this one eats ants. So that's a good partial solution. Or maybe you spray them, so you kill a bunch at once. The problem is that there are so many ants, and they reproduce so quickly, that no matter how, you, how many you kill, one at a time or even several at a time, um, there's going to be more. There's always going to be more ants to deal with. Until you deal with the colony, until you deal with the actual ant hill where they're coming from. Because once you deal with the ant hill, no more are coming in, are coming out into your yard, or coming into your house, or whatever the problem is. Once the problem is dealt with at its source, the problem is dealt with, and the problems are no longer getting worse. They're no longer extending themselves. They're no longer reproducing. So how do you do this? Well, there's two kinds of, um, well, as far as I know, at least, <laughs> uh, there's two general kinds of, uh, of, uh, of ant poison. Uh, one that is a kind of bait that the worker ants take back to the queen and it kills the queen, and so the ants are no longer reproducing. The problem isn't expanding anymore. And so eventually the individual ants will either die off, or you can squish them, or you can poison them, or you can spray them, or you can sick your cat on them, as you wish. And then you can deal with the problems bit by bit, now that they aren't reproducing themselves. Now the other kind of ant poison, at least commercially available, at least that I know of, uh, is uh, the kind that you sprinkle down and usually water in that poisons the ground. Now what this does is it makes the ground inhospitable or uninhabitable by ants. It kills all of them at once so that they can't individually keep going on living. Uh, this means that not only are you eliminating the source of the problem, but you are finding a solution to all of the kinds of, all of the problems that arise all at once. So what this does uh, is it solves your problem of there being too many problems by providing one solution to all of your problems. Uh, and so what this does is, effectively, it solves all of your problems in one action. And by solving all of your problems in one action, rather than having to deal with them all individually, an impossible problem comes with an easy solution. Now, how does this apply to the problem of evil, or Rose version in particular? Well, if Rose's problem is that there are too many problems to deal with, then our way of dealing with too many problems is to try and come up with a single solution for either all or most of them. One way of solving all problems under a certain category. So if, if what we need to do is provide theodicies for an indefinite number of instances of suffering, one way we could perhaps do that is by finding 
a theodicy that covers all of them. Either by finding the source of every instance of suffering and providing a theodicy for why God might permit that source of, that source of all of these different instances, or finding something that they all have in common that might be a reason that God has for permitting all of them. Unfortunately, this is much easier said than done. As far as I know, um, there have been uh, very few serious philosophical attempts, and, uh, and none that are at least broadly understood as are considered uh, successful, uh, of explaining a theodicy for every instance of suffering in the world, all at once, in one time. So what is to be done? If that's not doable, then we have to do something. So a solution to this problem would be to subdivide. To see if we can solve a lot of instances at once. If we can provide a theodicy for one category of, of instances of suffering, then suddenly we've taken this indefinite number and we've shrunken it down. And if we can do this sufficiently, maybe there will be, maybe we can say this category and this category and another category, and make the problem small enough and manageable enough such that uh, we can come up with a solution for the remainder. Well, there's, I think, a more straightforward way of answering this as well. Because if we want to subcategorize uh, sub and subdivide our collection of instances of suffering, the most efficient way of dealing with an indefinite number of problems in as few steps as possible is to provide uh, mutually exhaustive or totalizing categories. So categories which, based on the fundamental laws of logic, cover every possible instance. So this goes to the old, uh, the old half joke uh, of everything in the universe is either a potato or not a potato. Here we have two categories. We have potato things and we have non-potato things. Of course, this is not very useful for dealing with the problem of evil or looking at instances of suffering, um, but it provides us uh, a kind of illustration of the kinds of, uh, the kinds of categories that we need. Based on the law of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle, if we have categories such as this and not this, these are mutually exhaustive. They are totalizing. They cover every possible instance, in this case, every instance of suffering. So how do we decide on, on a categorization scheme? Well, we can look to some of the more successful ways uh, that philosophers have given for solving certain categories of instances of suffering. Um, the most prominent, perhaps, uh, and one with, with a very long history uh, that I think will get us on the right track is the free will defense. So the free will defense has, it has again, a long history, uh, but it goes something along the lines of uh, it, it picks out an inst a category of instances of suffering or kinds of evil that are caused by the free choices of rational agents. In other words, human free choice, or perhaps also including angelic free choice. And so it says that God has a reason to permit free will. Because through free will, we have the capability of not just doing good, but choosing good. And that makes our actions morally significant, and not just the actions of an automaton. That's just mere events that occur. Because of this, uh, God has a, a reason, therefore, to permit all of the instances of suffering that arise from the free choices of rational agents. This is called the free will defense because it defends against the claim of uh, the claims of the problem of evil by referring to free will as an intrinsic good, something which God per has reason to permit, and therefore God has reason to permit those things which come from negative, bad, evil free choices. So this gives us a category. Uh, what are typically called moral evils, or instances of suffering caused by human or angelic free choices, the free choices of rational agents. So if this is one category, those instances of suffering which are caused by the free choices of rational agents, that gives us a contrary category. Those instances of suffering which are not caused by the free choices of rational agents. This one is harder, because it's harder to find exactly what all of these instances of uh, what are called natural evils, those which are not caused by the free choices of 
of, uh, of moral and rational agents, it's hard to find what all of these have in common, if anything. However, let me give an illustration. It might actually give us an example. Take an instance of suffering caused by natural events, that is, not caused by free choice. Uh, take, for example, an accident, something which simply occurs that you did not choose to have occur. Uh, say, um, say, stubbing your toe on the coffee table in the middle of the night because you weren't fully awake and weren't paying attention and there was no rationality, no choice involved. It was a pure accident. But it was still an instance of suffering that merely happened to you. It was not intentional. It was no one's fault. It just occurred. And it would have been better had it not occurred. Because you're in pain. We can all think of this scenario when we get up in the middle of the night, we stub our toe, and ow, there's very little that hurts more than that in that very moment. And we certainly wish it didn't happen. We certainly wish that our toe did not hurt so bad, right? So what, what is this? Well, we could try to give a theodicy for this case. In particular, we could say maybe, um, maybe this is, maybe we will learn from this, like the location of our coffee table, or maybe we'll learn from this uh, that we ought not to um, that we ought not to go wandering about the house until we're awake or something like that. But that would be playing directly into Rose's hands. Right? That would be uh, that would be uh, trying to provide individual theodicies for individual instances of suffering, and we've already seen that that's impossible. That doesn't work. So how do we do this? What should we do? Well, we can look at a hypothetical a counterexample, a uh, a kind of um, uh, kind of counterfactual here. Suppose it didn't hurt. Suppose counterfactually that when you stub your toe on the coffee table in the middle of the night, you bump your foot, there's a big thud, you notice the coffee table there, you potentially learn your lesson not to do that, but all of this happens without your foot hurting. Your toe is no pain whatsoever. It would be better, right? Well, I want to question that. I want to bring into question whether that would in fact be better. Uh, because there is a, uh, this actually does happen to some people. Uh, you see, there's a, uh, there's a chronic neurological disorder uh, called chronic insensitivity to pain. Um, this can either be congenital, so from birth, or this can arise as a, uh, as a result of trauma or brain damage or some other causes. Um, and it, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is insensitivity to pain. We, the people who have this disorder do not experience pain at all. They still feel physical sensation, touch, etc., um, but they don't register injury as pain. Now, this is, now initially we might think this sounds wonderful, right? You don't experience pain. That's almost a superpower. However, this is an incredibly debilitating uh, illness. Uh, and the, the reason for this is because, um, well, for example, those who, those who were born with this condition very seldom live past childhood. Because having small children myself, um, I can tell you with absolute certainty, small children are incredibly prone to injuring themselves. And the only thing keeping those injuries from killing them is pain response, which gives rise to them stopping what they're doing and usually crying. So they inform somebody that they are in pain and then they stop doing the thing that was causing them pain. Now, if they don't have a pain response, they don't stop doing what they're doing, and they don't tell you about it. And this will very, very often, tragically, lead to the deaths of small children with this condition. Um, now, adults with this condition, there are people who learn, who grew up with it and learned to live with it. There are people who get this condition later on, later, on, later onset for whatever reason. Learning to deal with this condition is incredibly difficult because you're having to constantly check yourself for injuries that you didn't know that you sustained so that those injuries don't continuously get worse, <clears throat> right? The only reason that you can, you're incapable of walking on a broken leg, for example, is because of the pain that it causes. If you don't experience that pain, then you can walk around all day on a broken leg and then compounding that fracture further and further and causing all sorts of terrible things, infection, torn, uh, torn ligaments, and all sorts of sometimes irreparable sometimes fatal injuries. Pain, therefore, is incredibly useful. It is information. Now, it's unpleasant information. It is suffering. However, it is useful information. So if you stub your toe, what that, what's happening there is your nervous system 
is informing you that there has been damage to your toe and that you should see to that. You should avoid making it worse. So there's a reason that if you step on your toe and you put weight on your foot in the wrong way, that it's going to hurt again. What that's telling you is don't do that. That's information that you are receiving that you can then make use of. Okay, you say, fine, maybe we need pain to tell us that we've been injured, but what if we couldn't be injured? Aha, then we sure wouldn't suffer, and that would be a better world as well. And we can certainly imagine this. We can certainly imagine that if we were to stub our toe on the coffee table, that it, just, it wouldn't just not hurt, but that just we wouldn't be injured. There'd be no way of injuring ourselves in this way, or being injured by things in this way. But if we try and think about this a little more clearly, we will quickly find that this is incomprehensible, that this, is, that this leads very quickly to self-contradictions. <clears throat> we can show this by asking how would this occur? How would it be the case that if you run your foot into something, that the foot gets away from the thing uninjured? Oh, hey, Turbo. Uh, anyway, if that were to happen, uh, then it would have to be the case that there would be something that were different about either the toe or the table. And so if the table changed from, say, or the table leg, I suppose, changed from being made of wood to being made of something else, rubber, foam rubber, uh, air, whatever, um, what that would mean is that the wood that makes up the table would lack any consistent solid properties. And if it lacks any consistent solid properties, that means it lacks any consistent causal powers or causal relationships one direction or the other. Same goes for your toe. Right? So if your toe is suddenly immune to damage, then it too lacks any, any causal regularities, any causal patterns, any, uh, any, uh, any potentialities either to be caused or to cause other things. And if that is the case, then neither the wood of the table nor the parts of our own bodies or some combination thereof are comprehensible to us. We, in other words, okay, we, in other words, cannot understand anything about the world because there's no consistency to the world to be understood. So this is what we would essentially sacrifice in a world where we could not be injured in any way. In a world like this, in a world where uh, where causal regularity is determined purely on the basis of whether something would injure someone else or even something else, because, as we know here, we're talking about animal suffering as well, for, as far as Roe is concerned. And if that is the case, then we run into contradictions very quickly. Contradictions about what things are, contradictions about what happens when, say, Turbo here decides that, that me petting him is an act of suffering but then him leaving, if he were to leave, would constitute an act of me suffering. And so we're, we, we are at an impasse, so to speak, that one necessarily must suffer, and that that's a problem. And say, if I were to stop petting him, um, that would cause him to suffer because he wouldn't be pet anymore. But if I keep doing this for long enough, eventually my arm is going to get tired, and I will begin to suffer. Otherwise, if that weren't the case, then my arm would have to be configured of, again, something else. There would be no consistent causal regularity, no consistency about what we can observe about the world. And that becomes, that becomes another problem, which is that if we can't understand anything about the world, we can't interact with it. So think back to our coffee table. If we can't understand the natural and physical uh, characteristics of wood and steel, for example, then how can I use a steel saw to cut wood into the shape of a coffee table? I can't. If those properties are evanescent, if they change on a whim, I can't interact with the world. For another example, the thing, whatever it is, whatever device you're watching me on, whatever this is around me, surely it took an incredible amount of knowledge about the world and, it, and, and a very, very careful analysis and understanding of all of the causal regularities and patterns that surround all of the minute little details of its construction, none of which would be even the remotest bit possible 
if things could sort of change their natures according to whether things are going to be harmed by it or whether things will suffer as a result. And so what we have here is that the world, every part of it, whether us or animals or things around us, operates in consistent and predictable ways. In other words, the world makes sense. Now, this provides something of a theodicy, a theodicy from the consistency of nature, or the consistency of the world. God, we would argue, permits instances of natural suffering or natural evils because they are a result of the natural processes that make up this consistent and understandable world. In other words, the world works in predictable ways, and some of those ways have predictable albeit negative consequences. Because if that weren't the case, if it were not the case that the world worked in predictable ways, then we would have no way of interacting with it. And it is a much greater good for us to be able to understand and interact with the world than it, than it is an evil for us to suffer as a result of it. Even bigger pictures say, if, say, uh, we can think of, if, if, we can think of bigger natural disasters, uh, being a Floridian hurricane has come to mind, which are caused by things like consistent and predictable weather patterns. The, the environment of the world, the climate of the world, works in certain predictable ways, such that we can have incredible things like, like weather prediction, like air travel, even as something as simple as agriculture, which would be impossible if weather patterns were not at least in some sense, dictated by causal regularities of the natural world, of the way that the world is. But beyond that, even still, we can take this from the scientific understanding into the theological or the religious understanding as well, and we can look to this consistent nature of the world as a sort of glimpse into the mind of God. Thinking back to Aquinas' five ways, all of those started with observations about the world and about causal regularities within the world. And we begin by observing those things, and that leads us to a glimpse at the mind of God, that the, the organization behind creation, uh, creation, the divine logos, the word of John 1. That is certainly a greater good that is brought out of natural suffering. So between the two of these, between the free will defense for moral evils and the theodicy, of the consistency of the world for natural evils. What we've done is with two answers, with two theodicies, we have presented a solution, a theodicy, an explanation for every instance of suffering that occurs, has occurred, and can possibly occur. So what we've done is we have solved the problem of ever-increasing problems that Roe presents us with at least if these work. Now, this is, this, these are ongoing conversations in the philosophy of religion. Uh, these are new conversations. Roe did not write very long ago in, in sort of uh, in the grand scheme of things. So these are conversations that are still being had, and these are, uh, these are arguments that are still being uh, developed and challenged. So we can look forward to how this is going to develop. And so, of course, there are naturally far more things that we can talk about on this, and I can go into more detail on either of these at another time. But for now, I think we've given here pretty solid overview of the problem that Roe presents, as well as some of the, uh, the, the main parts of a potential solution to that problem. So, thank you for listening. That's all I have for now, so I'll see you next time. Bye. You good, buddy? Magic cat. Oh, you're all set.